resume recording. Gracious creator, I thank you for the hearts and minds of your children who come in search of all truth, which the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. Illuminate our hearts and minds concerning this woman of God who faithfully served your son as a disciple. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So we're Amen. revisiting Mary Magdalene. I did the slow pull tonight. <laughs> so if you remember Elizabeth Libby Schrader Holzer, she wasn't married the first time we did this study of her theological work. Now she is an assistant professor of New Testament at Villanova University. She recently defended her PhD in early Christianity and New Testament at Duke University. Her studies focused on textual criticism, Mary Magdalene and the Gospel of John. So she was a very serious woman when it came to being a student of the word. And I understand that everyone doesn't study at that level, but when you get information like this, it's very important that the community understands um, what has happened to the text throughout the time that people were living these things out. So here, we're going to look at this in Luke. We'll look at this in Luke 10, 38 through 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. We, how many of you have heard that story over and over and over again, heard it preached, everything else? Huh. I know I have throughout my life. Yes, yeah, yeah I've heard it. You know, and not that I remember all of the sermons, what they had to say about it, uh, but I do remember even being very young that this text was uh, preached. I don't know necessarily taught, but it was preached. Yeah. So Elizabeth is a very big part of some of the changes we may see concerning this text. Now, she was a doctoral student, uh, has her own way of honoring the women who witnessed Jesus's death and resurrection. And we are coming up on Palm Sunday and all those things. And you need to remember the power of who we are as women, as we celebrate Women's History Month, that these women had no fear. Their love for the son of God and the things of God outweighed anything that they could be afraid of. So her academic work, like that of others, attempts to liberate Magdalene from the patriarchal overlays of ancient Christian scribes who recorded the New Testament in four gospels. So she's attempting to liberate the historical aspects of who this woman is in sacred texts. That's not an easy undertaking. But why do you think she needed to be liberated? Why would anyone think Mary Magdalene needed to be liberated for in the sacred text? Anyone? She was bound by the law one. Well, and I think there were like seven demons that were cast out of her. Some translations say. Okay. Anyone else? I think because she was bound by the laws and they had to do the ritual, uh, According to what the law said, they they had to do certain things, and and she was not letting that stop her from getting that good part that he was talking about. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. 
anyone else, I want to leave the floor open. If there's anyone else that wants to talk about what she was being liberated from and what would you think the patriarchal overlays were? Oh, I think they just didn't like her for being a, a strong woman, just having the attitude of a, a woman. Oh. But I know that there is text that talks about being liberated from the demons inside her. Okay. So now the patriarchal overlays, Julius, you're uh, sometimes with referencing demons all the time is a part of the patriarchal overlay. So now I will say this yes. through her study and it's some of the reason that um, there have been times people have almost hit me with a Bible and said it's the infallible word of God. It is the infallible word of God, except for where the scribes made changes and made additions. The trick is knowing where they are. And I know that's a broad statement. If anyone wants to comment on that, you're welcome to. So the Nag Hammadi Library, this is a collection of early Christian scriptures and a few other miscellaneous texts. Discovered in the Egyptian desert in the middle of the 20th century, that has forced us to reconsider much of what we thought we knew about early Christianity, especially the type of early Christianity known as Gnosticism. Now, I, some people put this text into Gnosticism. I don't fully do that because there are gospels in there, the gospel of Thomas, the gospel of Peter. These are all the things that the emperor Constantine threw out because what they were doing with the Nicene council in 325, they were harnessing the spiritual information so that they had control up until that time. They did not have control of those who followed the pattern that Jesus had laid out for them. In fact, they were killing and tormenting them. Mm -hmm. So the discovery of this text and the Dead Sea Scrolls and things like that made people aware of what he was trying to hide by burning the text. Some people, whoever hid this particular book of, that had a collection of all the different uh, gospels and letters in it may have lost their lives for trying to hide it, but they succeeded in hiding it. And when it was relevant and the fullness of time, that truth started coming up and it still comes out a lot of the various truths around the world concerning sacred text. So I'm gonna see if I can read this. So in today's Bibles, Lazarus has two sisters, Mary and Martha. But pouring over hundreds of hand-copied early wow. Greek and Latin manuscripts of the gospel, Schrader, Elizabeth Schrader, found that the name Martha had been altered. Now, this is from one of the original scrolls that was translated. She found that the name had been altered. Hi, Miss Virginia. Hello. The scribe scratched out one Greek letter and replaced it with another, thereby changing the original name Mary into Martha. Now, when we're dealing with sacred texts, I don't know about you, but there's a, a, a verse at the end of Revelation that says, if you change the writings on this, the curses will be added to you. Mm -hmm. I guess that wasn't original either, huh? because they didn't have no problem changing this text and because of this woman doing the hard work the hard study she discovered that they had messed with the names then they split one woman into two schrader oh. argues that mary of the original text is mary magdalene not martha or martha's sister Mary. The two sisters belong to another story in the Gospel of Luke that is not repeated in John's Gospel. Do I need to read that again? And I'm going to open the floor for questions because this is serious information. I think those who love and the Messiah, Yeshua, love the God that sent Messiah, the Messiah, we need to know these things where they've tampered with the text that we love so dearly. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Well, 
If I may, um, because you said a few words in the beginning of that, but if I'm not mistaken, just to clear up for everyone, I believe the Apocrypha, which you mentioned, is in the Catholic Bible, some of the missing books that we don't have in the KJV. And then there are a lot of those books that are still to be discovered, like what, she, what, you're, what you're talking about. But I do think the Catholic, they, they have some of those books that we don't have, that, that we should have, that we don't have. But um, the Nag Hammadi has other literature that the Catholic does not have, is what I'm, is what I'm getting at. Like the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of, I think you said Luke. Um, but I, I just thought I'd, it, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe that that is the proper, um, the, the proper statement is that the Apocrypha is Catholic, correct? The Apocrypha at one point, everyone had the Apocrypha, including right. the Protestants. Back in the day, but they took it out and only the Catholic. So the Gnostic, there's a big difference in the Gnostics today and what the Gnostics were back then. And there's a lot of, it's kind of become kind of, um, there's good literature in it. I like a lot of the Gnostic <laughs> literature, like the Nag Hammadi, which you introduced me to years ago. I grew up on this because of Charlotte, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, but it has become something that people don't know about. It's it's they're they're sort of misplacing it with something that's pseudo like a pseudoscience and it's not pseudo. These were actual texts that belonged in the Bible and it's associated with something that's pseudo, but it's not pseudo. And you can see that with some of the Catholic books, but the Apocrypha and the Nag Hammadi, the, the Apocrypha belongs in the Catholic and it has some of that in the Nag Hammadi, but the Nag Hammadi has more of the missing gospels, like what you were talking about with the, the book of Enoch and the book of, or the Pista Sophia, or some of those other missing texts that were missing. But it's not, these things are not missing out of every Christian text and you would have to buy the Ethiopian Bible to see that. But what I'm trying to point out here is that the text has been tampered with. And that's why she's trying to redeem the qualities of this woman. That she had such a powerful personality and way of being. Because my thing is, what was the original text? Now I want to see the whole thing. And I haven't seen it. But what was the original text? As she places, there are sisters, Mary and Martha. But she places them somewhere else. This story right here literally was all about Mary Magdalene. But that it can't be... They had to change what was going on as well because it's like, well, was she up working and cooking and then told Jesus, you need to help me? I don't know. <laughs> That's why I'm thinking, well, did Mary, did Mary have to say, Jesus, now it ain't right for you to be sitting there. You need to get up and help me cook. Mm -hmm. So the my, place, go ahead. My question is, why did they have, they wanted that one person to be two? Was it to try to get a confusion? Uh, uh, they won't them to be able to uh, feel as if that one person was powerful enough to be two, or what was it that they they had in two different people? They had a one person and uh, two different person and one person. What was the purpose behind that? According to Schrader, they did not want her to have a prominent position in the text. Like we see a prominent position in the text from the apostle Peter or Paul or John, but they mm -hmm. did not want a woman to have a prominent position okay. in the text. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So therein gets the manipulating mm -hmm. of, of the text. So okay. I wanted to read a little bit from the Nag Hammadi. I put this over here from page 13. We can overcome the four elements of our attachment to matter, illusion and suffering, and all oppression of the soul. And I listened to my master, she's talking about Yeshua, and I felt my soul ascending. And as the soul ascended to the first element, earth, the soul asked, why are we afraid of death? 
for death itself is not fearful. It is the attachment or identification with our body that causes fear to arise. That, guess what? We, I have said it before, we feel some kind of way when we can't take a breath, we can only exhale. So that's a wrestling at the soul level. The soul is a little more connected to the flesh and there's a wrestling there. And because death is not what you're afraid of, what you're afraid of is not being able to take a breath and you don't need to take a breath because your soul and spirit is what? All breath. All breath. Yeah. Because God breathed into us and we became what? One. Living souls. There you go. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Any questions? Let me stop right here. Any questions? I know this is a lot. And uh, many uh, of our members were not privy to this teaching that I did. I actually did this teaching in 2021, had to go back and try to find it. It's on my old computer. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I was trying to find it to make sure I could bring the facts to you concerning this text. Let me say this. This does not change any of the finished works of Yeshua, but it sure does try to control your point of view of who should be, I guess, preaching the word. Because if they had not tampered with some of the text, more women would have been prominent in the text and you wouldn't have this thing of women can't preach and women can't teach and women can't do this. And, you know, women are only good for that. Everything we try to follow is right out of sacred text. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm saying to you, the sacred text is the sacred text. But sometimes, you know, you get you look at stuff and say, well, that just doesn't make any sense. I have found many times that it is the work of a redactor, someone that comes in and tries to clean up the text the way they think it should be. Mm -hmm. And the only way to know these things as believers is to do a sacred studies like we're doing now. And all of those people that did the redactor work, I'm sure they thought they were doing God's work in changing what the text said. Mm -hmm. So Schrader's central discovery, which she wrote about in her paper published by Harvard Theological Review two years ago, is that Mary Madeline's role was deliberately downplayed by biblical scribes to minimize her importance how many women have walked up and there's a conversation going on you're the specialist you may mean they have a degree in math or whatever and if it's a group of men they do not want to hear you will you repeat that your microphone is messing up okay mine's messing up no i think someone has their tv or something on um, oh. No, there are times, and I've experienced this as a pastor, you can be in a group of men and they're all engaging and exchanging thoughts and having a dialectic exchange and you begin mm -hmm. to come into that exchange and everything shuts down. They minimize your importance as a witness and a person who is carrying the the things of Yeshua with you and telling people the good news of who Yeshua is and what Yeshua did is downplayed many times when you do it as a woman. Any thoughts on my comment or what is being saying here that Mary Magdalene was downplayed to minimize her importance. So I'm willing to say that many times in societal norms, so to speak, we are downplayed to minimize our importance as well. This is true. You see that today. Y'all know I'm going to have plenty to say on that. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, as y'all know my lifestyle, um, Beth Salem. So I feel like we can have these grown up conversations, but I don't think it's just, I, I've been in situations where the men are at the round table because I'm prior military and I worked at a spec ops base. And I know what it's like when they get that brotherly and they start group thinking and bouncing ideas off of people. And if you're not a part of, if they don't see you as one of them, 
then, you know, they won't necessarily take you serious. I kind of see where Charlotte's going with that, but I don't think it's necessarily a female thing. It's not like it's testosterone's at the table and estrogen's trying to speak. It's more <laughs> the gender role. It's the role that they see you in. And see, the reason her and I are going <laughs> to, we're going to have this, um, educated discussion is because there's a specific commandment and if you translate it in the Jewish it says um, it says it, it tells the men to find them a wife not to find them a woman it says a wife and it's a title it's not necessarily a gen a gender as much as it is a gender role or I would say your sex rather than the role you play. And so I think that there are times when they may re when when people recognize the role you play or you know I teach special needs so it's very easy for certain people to recognize the role I play and I have to be conscious of that no matter how much I like it. That is something that we do. Um but that's just I thought I would share that too. It's it could be more of a gender role. So let me say this, some of the text that you're talking about, it is written in gender specific terms. So generally, mm -hmm. wife is the same word as husband. It's changed at the end, it's augmented or something because it is being gender specific. But it's a title. It has, it's a title and Mary wasn't looking for a title. Mary was doing what all of the other disciples were doing. She was following Yeshua. She was hanging on every word that Yeshua had to say. Okay. And for that, because they didn't want her to be prominent in the text as a disciple, they minimized her importance. Mm. Any any further comment on that? I don't okay. know who all is here. I see um, Reverend Inez. Julius. Oh, Laura's here. Hi, Johnny's Laura. Here. Angela. Johnny's here. You know, I'm going to be right Do you have a <laughs> comment, Johnny? I sure do. I'm sorry that I was late. Brutus had oh. me out walking. Good for Brutus. <laughs> so, any comment, Johnny? Yeah, I love you guys. <laughs> love you too. Okay, we love you. <laughs> I know she means about Mary Magdalene, but no, no comment on that. So I also, because I want to share this text with you, because many times we're taught that the 66 books of the Bible, you don't read any further or beyond that. But when you go through the historical aspects of sacred text and how it was shaped into what we know it as now, you understand that they began to remove a lot of it because what needed to be removed in my assessment, it may not be yours, was for the shaping of consciousness, for the control. The thing is, if you understand the power of who you are spiritually, and that is not controlled, you become dangerous, just like Yeshua became dangerous. So another part of the Nag Hammadi uh, library. At this point, Mary wept and said to Peter, my brother Peter, what can you be thinking why do you not believe the words of our Lord? Do you really think that this is all my fancy, my own fancy, or that I would lie about the Savior? At this point, Levi rebuked Peter, saying, Peter, you have always been a hothead. And now we see you doubting a woman as worthy as Mary, just as our adversaries would do. If our Lord held Mary in high esteem, who are you to question her integrity and reject her words? We all know our Lord loved Mary in a way that he loved no other. Now, that doesn't mean anything about intimacy. If you're okay with Yeshua loving John the way he loved no other, you should be okay with him loving Mary the same way. But because our consciousness has been shaped in a way to make us think that something is wrong, that a man and woman cannot love each other, and it has nothing to do with intimacy, a physical relationship, the uh, the movie world and people out there, even if you go look up this text, they add all that verbiage. None of that is said there. You have to mm -hmm. read every last bit of that 
into this particular text from the Nag Hammadi library. But you see Peter, because when Mary would be with Yeshua, because Yeshua, again, according to this gospel and the gospel of Peter, how many days and night do we say Jesus came in and out of the earth after the resurrection? Anyone? Four times. 40 days and 40 nights, he came in and out of the earth teaching and being in contact with the disciples. This yes. text says it was much more than that. That there was a long period that Yeshua was teaching. And there's a part, I don't think I put it in here, because Yeshua came to all of them and they said, well, Lord, where have you been? And the different realms in the higher heavens just like they say heaven is, they have gate and control. So once the fallen one had come to this realm, the fallen one took control of those gates and who went through them and who came out of them took control of that. So when Yeshua says, I've made a way that can't nobody block it, that's because he went and took control of all those realms all the way up to the feet of his father. Mm -hmm. So we don't get that in regular text. But Yeshua, and it even tells that when Yeshua came to one of the realms, that the gate that was there just buckled and opened at the presence of the Son of God. Mm -hmm. Why that had to be excluded, I have no clue. Because a rabbi that I studied with, he talked about when he ascended, he had been praying and learning the sacred names and was meditating very hard. And he ascended into the presence of God. This was a fully Jewish man. He's now fully Jewish and Christian because he said when he got there, he saw the creator sitting in the high seat and Yeshua sitting to the right hand of God. But on the way, the journey through all the realms and the higher heavens, he said he was in a protective like tunnel or bubble. He said he could hear things growling, cursing, trying to scratch where he was going through, they couldn't get through. This mm. text supports what that rabbi said to me. Yeshua made a way that can nobody open or close, including anything that's fallen and part of the fallen thoughts. If your thoughts are falling, Connect to Yeshua. Yeshua will make a way that will lift your way of thinking, that will lift your way of being. So it's also in the, it's all in the spiritual realm that Yeshua went and he opened all that and he made sure that they knew you don't own this gate. You can't stop anybody from ascending to God because of my finished works. And if you need to get in your house in hell, I'll need to let you in because I got the key. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure you guys ask questions. So Schrader argues that Mary of the original text is Mary Magdalene, not Martha. Ma I look, I can't help it. I'm country, not Martha or Martha <laughs> or Martha's sir, sister Mary. The two sisters belong to another story in the Gospel of Luke. That is not repeated in John's gospel. The reason for the train, Schrader said, was that the later scribes did not want to give Mary Magdalene too big a role in the events of Jesus's life. Already, Mary Magdalene is at the crucifixion, the empty tomb, and in the gospel of Luke, she is exercised of seven demons and then traveled with Jesus and supplies him funds needed for his ministry. So if you get this one woman, that means not just one woman, one man, one woman, one child can be delivered of such horrible things and then uh, walk on a spiritual journey that makes them ascend in ways that they can raise the right questions, disseminate spiritual truths that are being given to them, catch the wind of wisdom. So you think about that. If they had to minimize her importance, look at all she was delivered to, not just what she was delivered from, what she was delivered to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any questions?
Well, y'all getting mighty quiet. You know, and I want to say this as well. When I read the Nag Hammadi uh, library, some people do put this in with Gnosticism. I do not. And let me tell you why. Marcion was the one who coined and was pushing Gnosticism. And Gnosticism, their thinking was this. Everything that is spiritual is good. Anything that is of the flesh is bad. And that leads you down the wrong road. So as this gentleman Marcion went on with all of his intellect and high knowledge, he said, well, if everything spiritual has been delivered, then that means everything flesh is evil. And the Hebrew God is the one that created flesh and that God is no good. Uh. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's Marcion. That's who was the leader of Gnosticism. So then he goes further to say, because Yeshua had a fleshly body, he only raised in the spirit. He did not raise up in the flesh. So that's why I, when I go through the Nag Hammadi library, none of that mess is there. Either God is a redeemer or God isn't. Either God prepared a body of someone one that was coming to redeem not only the soul, spirit, and the flesh, or God just sent Jesus here to give us a, a hope of something we won't see. Mm -hmm. Any but, thoughts on that? So that's some of the reason I don't pull the Gnosticism into this. I don't think it has any place. May I say really quickly, um, <clears throat> because there is some different literature on, on Gnosticism, and I know it's we have a pastor who likes historical context, which is so good um, when bringing content like this to the to the table and it needs to be discussed more. It's really difficult with Gnosticism because they were not taken seriously back in early Christianity. But there is a lot of relevancy the, what she's talking about with the Nag Hammadi library, that brought Gnosticism from being like a pseudo belief to like, oh, we should probably start listening to the Gnostics because they have content such as the 33 vertebrae, which I've talked about before. They talk about the microcosm and the macrocosm. And those are, so when I said a scene, um, Jesus was in a scene, some of those mystic things. Um, that he was a part of the Essene sect of Judaism. Those were so things. Julius, that let me stop you right there because when you're doing a class of this type and I do try to bring Beth Salem uh, master level information, throwing out various terms without content and context can muddy the waters of what we're focusing on. So and believe me, I know and knew a, a Gnostic, a practicing Gnostic, and they do not believe anything in the flesh is good. And that's why I was saying, I don't put this in. Some do put this in with Gnosticism. I do not. So you introduce that and other terminology that, because I, I want to make sure everyone, when we put forward another type of uh, terminology that it is fleshed out and parsed out so that everyone can understand it. So you're introducing things that are not in the study that I'm aware of because uh, I'm a student of God forever, but I'm not, uh, m people who are here to learn about Mary are not aware of those things that you're speaking of. You're not aware of a scene? I'm saying we're not dealing with the Essenes here. I've done a whole study on the Essenes. And if I get a consensus and people want me to restudy the Essenes, that sect of Judaism that withdrew themselves from any, from any of the Jews that had made deals with the Romans and were living in the city and lived out in the wilderness. Yes, I can readdress that. But this is not what that is about. Okay. Okay. 
So, cause see you're pulling in, Mary had nothing to do with the scenes or any of that. This is about the text that the gospel of Mary that she wrote because she wanted other people to know what the Lord Jesus had said to her. The, uh, the high wisdom and spiritual introspective that she had been given through Christ Jesus. Any, any further questions? Not that Joyous is just introducing other information. I'm not saying the information is wrong. He's just introducing things in my assessment that do not filter into this study of revisiting Mary Magdalene. Well, and I, I just, I have to say, because I heard you mention the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Apocrypha, and then the Nag Hammadi Library. And so I'm just trying to identify that, you know, the Nag Hammadi Library is Gnosticism. The Apocrypha is in the Catholic Church. The Dead Sea Scrolls are their own branch of like 50 missing books of the Bible or, or not traditionally put in the Bible that we did discover. I think what was it, in the 40s or something like that. But um, that's all I was really trying to identify because there were levels of mysticism, but Mary, Mary Magdalene, she served under a disciple of someone who did practice some of those mystical works. And so even though you're, you're saying that she was undermined as a disciple or as a prominent figure to Jesus, there were also other things that were undermined by about Jesus that the Gnostics recognize. And so that's and not that, traditional. And so you're bringing in Gnosticism. And I think what I'm saying, I'm not teaching tonight on Gnosticism. I'm teaching on the gospel of Mary Magdalene and this um, Dr. Schrader's uh, research work that she did in finding that they purposely changed a certain part of the text to hold this personality that served Yeshua to hold that personality back. The same work was not done to hold Peter back. The same work was not done to hold John back or any of those people, but work was done to hold this female back so she would not have prominence in the text. So specifically, Schrader looks at the story of the raising of Lazarus in the gospel of John. In today's Bible, Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha. But pouring over hundreds of hand-copied early Greek and Latin manuscripts of the gospel, Schrader found that the name Martha had been altered. So again, she's going through all of these ancient things. Her coining Greek had to be on point because she's noticing what's done. And you generally, if you're doing research, you want to go back to some of the oldest documents there are. Because that sometimes eliminates the work of scribes and redactors. So that's why when you see something that's very long, you think, oh, that's the original. But you get to the original and it's one paragraph. That was the original. Someone else came in and pontificated on what was there. And you took mm -hmm. it as gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The scribe scratched out one Greek letter and replaced it with another, thereby changing the original name, Mary to read Martha. Then they split one woman into two. This is a fact. This is a theological fact that this woman did the research of going through all those old scrolls, probably sitting around for magnifying glass as big as my head and body to see all of the little nuances to know that someone intentionally went in and changed this text. I open mm. the floor for any thoughts before I go to the next uh, slide. Well, all of these things is written in Greek. Mm -hmm. Some uh, Aramaic... Greek, Latin, I don't know if I'm missing, because you have the Septuagint and that's written in um, Greek and you can find that in Latin, but this, uh, she's looking at the coining Greek in this instance. Okay. Oh, look, that altered. The, um, so I'm trying to look at the, 
what the original what what the scripture says in the uh King James Version. And my question is, so uh this would alter the scripture. How would that affect the scripture that we read today? It would correct it. And I, mean, I would rather know the true text. The thing is, they're not going to correct it because what they put in place has worked so well to keep us spiritually trapped in what they want us to be in and why yeah. we can't honor one another, irregardless of our gender. We can't honor one another. They do not want those scribes and spiritualists. They were trying to hinder who you are spiritually. It doesn't matter. Um, Mary and Martha, but it does matter that they took this one woman and pulled her out of the text in a way that minimized who she is. Mm -hmm. And that's why mm -hmm. it has happened across the world for generation after generation after generation, women get dumbed down. Yeah. Yeah. And because it started in the text. That's why I said those people that wanted to slap me with the Bible and say, this is the infallible word of God. Mm -hmm. it's your infallible word to keep a control over women who have spiritual experiences and generally uh, females have spiritual exper experiences and intuition above men and that's not bragging that's just who we are we know the baby getting ready to cry daddy don't mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we roll over in the middle of the night say, hey, hold, hold on I need to stop get up and pray for my baby I don't know what's happening right now I gotta pray for my girlfriend you don't know they that was just in a car wreck you don't know that your daughter is walking back to her dorm room and she's in danger but God told you to pray and you did Mm -hmm. Say it loud, saying, sister. Amen. Say it loud. Amen. Amen. And that mm -hmm. happens to men as well. But if we were to do a consensus that happens with women, we are have more of a spiritual radar. And mm -hmm. I will share with you why I think we do. When you go in the Hebrew, the sacred names for God, you can change them and make them feminine, but the Ruach Kakodesh, the Holy Spirit. Is feminine energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In Jewish texts, that spirit of God is feminine energy. And then I will further say when God created Eve to be a helper, you, when you go get help for your math exam, do you go to the dumbest person in the class or do you go to the smartest? The smartest. <laughs> smartest. Mm -hmm. just saying and if oh. you were created to be a helper there you have it that's right so can i just so on the chessboard the most important pieces are the king and the queen and there's dysfunction if both of them are not on there there's no one to, to beat up to get another one you gotta have both of them mm -hmm. and neither are insignificant so actually yes actually Actually, in chess, if you get one of your pawns to the king's row of your opponent, then you can select whatever piece you want and put it back on the board. All right, now. I say, darling, you must play chess. <laughs> I, I used to. I used to. <laughs> I did, too. I don't remember all the nuances, but I know there are, are certain figures on the board that are, are very important. So, oh, and I... Go ahead, Angela. I want to kind of go back to something, Sister Inez. That's the name I see. If that's not your name, I apologize. But that's what's that's it. Okay. <laughs> um, I think sometimes we, uh, and rightly so, will beat up on the predecessors around the writers of the text. But I also want to just lift up and remind us that we're talking about people where the masses of the people did not read or write. Um, scribes were um held to just write right and so you got all of that taking place on top of if somebody had to write the history of beth salem with the name patty and paul i would imagine that if you if we were 100 years in the future things that patty may have done or paul may have done because of their names um and their proximity to the work at Beth Salem may get confused 
and the writer may just merge together their work. And so they become one person so that that person then what handled finances in the church and did clerk work rather than trying to separate them out and tell their, their story separately. And then if you add Linda into that, and um, as a person that also uh, w walked with and, and represented Beth Salem before the high council <laughs> of the Presbytery, right? And so they may not know a hundred years from now, these people might all of a sudden, the, the, the function of what they did may merge into um, one function as opposed to having three separate people who handled the work of Beth Salem. So similarly, when you look at the text in the merging of stuff, it was easier for writers who's, who wrote all day long, right? Trying to copy from one to the next, to the next, to the next is how we get these texts. Um, and I, if they like me, I cut shoes, right? I ain't gonna always say Patty and Paul. Eventually it'll be P and P, and then it might go down to just P. And then I gotta deal with P and L because there's Linda in there. And then you gotta deal with Miss Care. So so I wanna be a little soft on um, those who handled the text, but literally if we think about it in those terms, it would have been easy to merge folk. I also think um, some scholars believe that Mary of Magdala, um, separate from what this scholar is saying, was actually from a region. And so anyway, so there's a there's a lot of varying, and I appreciate the fact that our pastor does such uh, enormous study um, to bring to us, for us to see it in a different light, right? To see it, to try to peel away and get to what we see as the, the nuances of truth and how truth merges uh, for us to be able to handle this walk uh, in the 21st century. Reverend Brown, I must say, I love, absolutely love your heart, your wisdom, and your discernment. Yeah, thanks. Amen. <laughs> so I will <laughs> add to that that Angela is correct, but this was not the joining together of people this was actually a story about one person and that person got split into two people in mm -hmm. the story and maybe was talking about two different people it had nothing to do with mary magdalene according to this theologian and her research guys i think we're almost done we're almost done. I hope this is adding a blessing to your lives. You it get is. such good conversation. Mm -hmm. Julius is, is filled with a lot of information. Angela is also a student of sacred text. And just hearing the comments and how people are looking at it, I'm glad you're going to the text and looking at it. And I pray you will go and read it and look at it in the synoptic gospels, where it's spoken of and where it isn't and that it will continue to elevate you. So Schrader traveled to Munster, Germany. Did I pronounce that right, Paul? Mm -hmm. Munster. Mm -hmm. It's Munster, okay, Munster, Germany, mm -hmm. to meet with the elders, the editors of the Nestle Aland New Testament, the edition of the Greek text used by most scholars, students and translators today. <laughs> she discussed her findings about the changes made in the text of John's gospel and said the editors may consider adding a footnote to that effect in upcoming editions. Schrader's paper <gasps> comes at a time when many scholars are trying to recover women's roles in early Christianity, roles the early church fathers tried to suppress. So she goes to them, to the, the publisher of these translations to say, hey, 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 there's a problem here. Now, I would think if I had written something and it was wrong, I would say, oh, no, I'm going to just correct it. They, uh, no, we're going to just do a footnote. So unless you have someone, there are other, um, I think women in, in spe doing specialty things for women, whether it's womanist the theology or feminist, uh, they're coming out with this study to say, hey, there are times 
you know, women get so suppressed and it's things like this, but will they change that text? No, they'll put a footnote. And I would like to think in the scheme of the things that God has called each and every one of us to, whether you've been the greatest mother and grandmother, caregiver, all of those things, you're not a footnote to God. You may be in this realm to some people, but never to the one who loves and adores you. I agree. And I just think that that's why it's important for us to journal, to write our stories whether we right now on TikTok pastor or um, my mom taught 52 years in the school system from uh, kindergarten to sixth grade. Wow. And she taught kids who everybody had given up on and they would eventually start to skip grades. I've asked her over and over again, like, how, what were your teaching methods? How do you do it? How, you know, so all of us have those kinds of stories, even in our own lives, in our own families that I think what, what Mary's story does, what this text does for us in this Bible study is to say it's important, again, as you say, for us not to be the footnote, but that we tell our stories. And if we don't tell it any place else, that we make sure that there's somebody in our family, our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, our churches, that we tell our story so that 100 years from now, we don't have to be split into two people or brought together as one. Oh, no, don't be insensitive at all. Say that ready? again, Miss Virginia. I said oh, either we don't be a, be a part of the world at all. Amen. But do you have some of those highlights that were missing from her book? There are highlights that are that have never been found from uh, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. So that lets you know that must have been some good, whatever it was, it was good. So when they found it, they they all of a sudden said, this is missing. Mm -hmm. Because I will tell you, the control of the people is what causes you to have a government. The strongest one that has control of the people, and they say, yes, yes, yes. That's the people that, hey, you are right. But whatever there are, I think either four verses or some beginning verses that are missing in the gospel of Mary Magdalene. They didn't say, see, I was reading. See, when you read, you got to read. They said they were missing. They didn't say they were not there. Yeah. They're missing. So I read that. I was like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where the rest of that text? <laughs> So Mary Magdalene's gospel starts with missing pages. These are the words we can't get back. This is the wisdom, the voice of Christ from, a, from the heart of a woman that was torn out and mostly likely destroyed before the rest of her gospel was buried. And I probably, I know some people say something different, but there was something so incendiary in these first six pages that the, her gospel starts on page seven. Is that not giving you a hint that it was removed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's something poetic about that. Since according to Mary's gospel, seven is the number of stages we need to go through or powers we need to confront within ourselves to reach clarity or singularity of heart that lets us see past the ego of our own little lives to what's more real and lasting and infinite and already here within us. Mm -hmm. Three copies of the Gospel of Mary have been recovered. Two in Greek, one in Coptic. So there's that other language, one in Coptic. All three versions of her Gospel are missing the beginning and then also four pages in the middle. And those four pages would have contained the answer to what I believe is one of the most significant questions we could ever know. Mary asked Jesus. So she was always raising questions to have a better understanding. I can't read the top of that. Can somebody else read it for me? The top I will of now it. reveal to you that what would not yet be made known to you. I had a vision of our Lord and I said unto him, Lord, I see you now in a vision. And he said unto me, Mary, you are blessed. For my appearance does not make you afraid. Where the noose, awareness in itself, is 
there lies the treasure. I reply to him, Lord, when someone meets you in a vision, it is through our soul that we are not able to see you. Or is it through our spirit? And the Lord answered, Mary, it is neither, but it is the noose between the two which sees the vision, and it is and and it is this which makes us fully human. So the noose is the breath. Do you guys get that? Noose mm -hmm. is dealing with the awareness of yourself. It's your mind. So you have a vision. You see it with the mind that sits between the soul and the spirit. So if your mind isn't right and they uh, messed around with your text, can you have a clear vision or even understand one that you mm. should be able to understand? Yeah. Any thoughts on this? Because she's raising all of the right questions. And I love that he says, you're not afraid because I appeared. Now, Julius and I know we're from North Carolina. You let somebody say they see a ghost or like when my grandfather passed away, the night he passed away, everyone was there at the house and he died at the house. And my grandmother said a broom slowly went down the wall and fell. She said the house was clear in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but Yeshua was like you're not afraid that mean, that gives me the impression from this text some people still were afraid and marveling at the fact that this man is walking around with his side pierced holes in his hands and feet and asking for a sandwich mm -hmm. and they gave him the sandwich because they were afraid not to <laughs> <laughs> Any questions around this? This is one of the favorite uh, pieces of her text that I love. And um, to know that, yes, there's a mental thing that you must do. You're, that's why sometimes I may argue the centering of who you are, that mental capacity. Because you had to do a thinking process to come through and understand and accept Yeshua as the Messiah. There was a, a, a conversation that went on with you and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads into all truth. Sometimes we'll say, well, believe with your heart. Why do you, the heart, you, according to the text, is the most deceitful thing. Doesn't say the mind is, though, does it? Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. So this is my favorite, that neither you see it with the mind that sits between the two. But they're not talking about the brain in that, if I, if you will allow me to say. I'm telling you that they are, because I've read several translations. I'm telling you that they are. When it talks about the, the awareness of self comes from the physical mind. So I'm telling you that they are. That is what they're talking about. And Coptic is the precursor to e ancient Egyptian. That's what okay. they studied in Alexandria. They spoke Coptic and that would be the pre, that's what we study nowadays to learn ancient Egyptian. You have to take Coptic first. Yeah. Okay. And you say all of that to say. No, I, you just said the other language was Coptic and I just explained what that was. Good Google search. <laughs> no, I knew that one. I'm sure you did, but it started with a Google search. Hey, Serena. Hey, John. You know, if I can uh, interject, uh, you know, Julia said that the Apocrypha is in the Catholic Bible. When I was in my 20s, the uh, Reverend Tom Drake, that's the church that I went to, and he was the, he was the Reverend there. He would do Bible studies on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights, and he talked about how the King James Version does not have all the text in it, and that some text had been taken out, and some text had actually been rewritten for the King's benefit, and, mm -hmm. the, and he was the first pastor that I'd ever heard say 
that about the Apocrypha. So the first thing I did is I went to our local Christian bookstore and I bought it. I saw you flash that earlier uh, whenever you went and pulled it up. I thought that was so cool. Yeah, that is um, really insightful. Yeah, so, so a lot of the stuff that you talk about, um, it, it just hits home because it's not the first time that I've heard it or read it when I've been doing my own Bible study. So I want to thank you for that, that you take the time to, to bring this out because, you know, it, you can do Bible study, regular Bible study and just go through the text. And this is what we think they were saying or whatever. But you dig down and and give us the, the meat that we need, not just the bread and butter. So thank you. Well, if we give mm -hmm. you just the bread and butter, then we'll just be overweight Christians unable to run the race <laughs> <laughs> right right so and then uh when you're when you're doing a uh, theological work when you talk about digging in and digging out that's what we call exegeting that's exactly what you do you dig into that text you dig into the history of that text all of that stuff and you get every bit of goody god put in there out Yes. And then you then you learn where the Coptic language originated. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop recording.